oh, by the way, here's the part where you, if you clip this sentence and post it as a reel, you will get so much pushback. All right, we're here with the man, the myth, the legend, Scott Stokely. Legend? I, I told you earlier, legend just means old. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to be pretty awesome to be an old legend. So, <laughs> uh, an old legend. Uh, so. But um, so we wanted to see if Scott would talk about the mental game a little bit. And um, and so appreciate you being here. Yeah, no, happy to. Yeah. My first question was, uh, have you ever struggled with the mental game? I mean, when I was younger, I struggled with having a temper. I mean, I was a teenager, so we're that's like, like that were like thirty something years ago, or wait, oh my god, forty something. Um, honestly, I really haven't struggled with mental game. Yeah, uh, is the approach that I take is kind of bulletproof, I think, for me and. It just hasn't really been an issue. And part of it is because I don't... Oh, by the way, here's the part where you... If you clip this sentence and post it as a reel, you will get so much pushback. I don't think the mental game's that important. How about that? I just contradicted every smart person in the world, on, in the world of sports. That's a hot take. That's what I think. Awesome. I, and we'll go into the weeds. I'll explain it. Don't click off until you <laughs> <laughs> give me a chance to explain why, and I, I, I might convince you. Nice. Um, so, you want to go ahead and expand on that? Cause that's oh, kind of sure. I'm oh, happy to. So, everyone knows mental game is important. Everybody, that's what everybody will tell you. So, let's pick a sport where things are a little more obvious, but this applies to everything else. Maybe you can't, like you might be able to see if someone's 300 pounds when they play football and you can't see that they're super coordinated when they're sh you know, shooting billiards. But there's something physically there that makes them fit to that sport, right? But we'll take an obvious one. We'll take basketball, for example. Go to the University of Kentucky. There's probably 15,000 male students on campus. The most coveted role of any play of any male student in, at the University of Kentucky is being one of the twelve players on their basketball team. Could you pick them out of a crowd? Yeah, they're the tallest. They're the most athletic. Like that—that's a basketball player. They have all the physical gifts that lead to being a basketball player. I personally don't see this correlation to mental game. I don't go, and I'm not picking on Kentucky, but I don't look at the 12, the 12 players for the University of Kentucky basketball team and go, you know, those are the 12 most well-adjusted young men on campus. They're the 12 most confident men on campus. They're the 12 men with the ability to push down anxiety more than any other player or person. No, they're the 12 tallest. They, they have they, they now they're, they they've got the physical abilities they've got the mechanics they've got the the the, the the they put the time into getting good and so the the mental part of being a uh, player that made the team as opposed to all the the tall young men who aren't on the team is they had the mental toughness to work harder and practice harder they had to have some level of humility to be coachable they had to have the discipline to go out and shoot free throws when their friends were going out to party. Like, there were there's certain mental elements that led them to that place. But as far as during a competition, is there something inherently different mentally than them or inherently better than them than other people on campus? I don't see it. Like, I mean, they're just young men like every other student on campus with just as many backstories and traumas and tempers and lack of confidence and fear and anxiety as everyone else. The correlation to me isn't the 12 mentally strongest kids in Kentucky or in Lexington play for the basketball team. It's the 12 best basketball players, the 12 best athletes, the 12 best mechanics with the 12 most natural physical gifts. I just don't see the correlation to mental game. Now, I'm not saying mental games isn't important. I, I just listed a number of things. Better. Discipline, hard work, sacrifice. Sure, those are, I mean, of course, I'm not saying mental game doesn't matter. 
but take that five foot two, can't keep the pounds off, <laughs> slow, uncoordinated kid. I don't care what his mental game is. Right. Take a super athlete, and he could have the most screwed up temper, mental game in the entire world, and he's still starting for the team. And and I, just, I don't see it. I don't see the correlation. So if, if we relate that to disc golf, if there's someone that, um, say, when they practice, they're hitting all their putts, mm-hmm. but they get into a tournament, and all of a sudden they can't hit any putts. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any advice for them? Yeah. So there's a reason why I started by trying to make the case that mental game wasn't as important because the under or the acceptance of demystifying the whole mental aspect of the game is the first step to having a strong mental game or have the right mental approach. So um, this is going to take a minute if you're okay with that. So there is something in sports called the illusion of control. And the illusion of control is the illusion that you have control over the outcome of your physical endeavors. Like, you, it, it, the idea that you control whether or not that putt goes in is an illusion. Now, the reason it's an illusion is that that seems counterintuitive. You're the one standing there. You're the one holding the disc. It feels like you're in control over whether or not it goes in. If you were actually in control over whether or not that putt went in, that would also mean that every time you missed, you did it on purpose. It's a dent. You don't control the outcome. There is no control whatsoever. What you have are probabilities. You have the likelihood of that shot going in in that given situation. You have no control over the outcome of any individual shot. So I want to go back to basketball because I think when we talk about free throws, it's the easiest thing to quantify, and there's numbers to quantify this. Mm -hmm. If a person is an 80% free throw shooter, over the course of the season, they make 80% of their free throws. But when they step up to the line in a game situation, there is nothing that that player can do to elevate their chances of making it to higher than 80%. Nothing. And the data backs this up. Everything I, I believe as far as psychology is, is driven by the actual data. So the reason I believe this is that in the entire history of sports, with a large enough sample size, with a, with a statistic that you can quantify, there has never been a clutch athlete ever in the history of sports. Now, that seems... Again, completely counterintuitive. I told you I was going to contradict all these smart people out there because you're like, of course there's clutch athletes. We know there's clutch athletes. We've seen the highlight reels. You know, let's look at like Michael Jordan, the greatest clutch basketball player of all time. Michael Jordan's shooting percentage in the playoffs was the same as his shooting percentage in the regular season. He didn't elevate his game for the playoffs. He was the best player during the playoffs because he was the best player on the team. That's it. So Michael Jordan's three-point percentage with less than two minutes to go in a game was not higher than his three-point percentage in the second quarter. His three-point percentage on game-tying or game-winning shots in the final 30 seconds was no higher than his season average. He was not clutch. We think he's clutch for a number of reasons. We think he's clutch because he made the most clutch shots, he, the most shots in that situation. Well, of course he made the most shots. That's who you give the ball to. He took the most attempts. But percentage-wise, he wasn't any better in that situation. You gave him the ball because he was the best player on the court. He was the most likely to make the shot. You want him to take that shot. We forget the misses. We remember the makes. The makes make the highlight reels. They play him before every game. They play it on montages whenever they do the, the goats of basketball. Michael Jordan wasn't clutch. If you have a large enough sample size, so you can't count one Super Bowl where some receiver gets 12 catches or something, but with a large enough sample size, nobody has outperformed their season average. There is no such thing as a clutch player. We can can prove this. Now, on the flip side, however, given a large enough sample size, there are players who choke. So nobody plays above their season or career average with a large enough sample size 
there are uh, well outside of the expected variance right there's a there's a predictable variance of how far above or below based on how many shots you took or games you played but there are players who have underperformed they've had enough important games where they fall beneath their predicted variance so there is evidence that players choke there are players who can't handle the pressure whether it's because of anxiety that, that where they, they're breathing heavier whether it's they're distracted, whether they're, they're beta or alpha waves or doing something sciencey. There are players that choke, but there are no players who can elevate their game above their average. So here's what the mental approach, I think, is the only mental approach that you can like quantify with data, which is you cannot perform better in a clutch situation or in a, let's just say a competitive situation. You cannot outperform what you do in the backyard. You can, however, underperform in tournament situations. So how would you stop yourself from under? Mm -hmm. That's what I get to. So the first step in that is if you believe everything I just said for the last 10 minutes, and if you don't, you're going to have a hard time buying into this concept. But what I've been doing for the past 10 minutes is trying to make the case for this whole clutch illusion of control myth. Because if you buy into it and realize, oh my God, I don't have control. Oh my God, I can't be clutched. There is no trick. There is no mental game. There's no visualization. There's no breathing exercise. There's no focus thing. I can't do anything to elevate it. All I can do is not underperform. And then you realize that you don't have control. Because, it, because you don't have control, that letting go of control takes away the things that could cause you to underperform. The stress, the anxiety, the alpha, beta, science part, I don't know. But when you feel like you have control, that's a level of stress. It's like the, the world's on your shoulders. You're in charge of this putt. You're in charge of your performance. You're in charge of going home and telling the family how bad you played. You're in charge of... That's a hell, like That's insane. I can't even imagine that amount of pressure. I got to make this putt. I got to put a piece of plastic into a tiny little target 36 feet away, that almost seems impossible to me. But if you realize that you don't have any control and you go, oh, all I can do is step up and do this. That's all you can do. Well, then now you're replicating your level in the backyard, which the level in the backyard is the highest level you can physically do because that is your physical limits without something potentially making you worse. So far makes sense? Mm -hmm. So, then it becomes, well, how do I, so there's no trick to playing better mentally, well, then, then, then what do you do? Well, you don't control, like if you're a 70% putter from 30 feet, you don't control when you step up whether you're going to make that putt or not. You'll on average make 7 out of 10. What you can control is, can I step up to that putt and be a 7.5 out of 10, 7.8 out of 10? Because what you do control is how much you practice. You do control whether you have proper mechanics. You do control um, whether you're hydrated, whether you got a good night's sleep. Uh, probably helps to not be going through a divorce right now. I suppose that would probably distract you into missing putts. Like you, you have control over, over different elements. Control the stuff you can. Elevate your probabilities as high as they can be based on your level of athleticism, training, fitness. Mm -hmm. You know, and then once you do that, you step up and you just let go and just go through the motions. All I can do is this, just like the backyard and seven out of 10 are going to go in if that's what my level is. But what's important is that you don't go to a tournament and have five out of 10 go in because you're stressed and have anxiety and distracted and you're breathing heavy and your heart rate's up and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's when I say I don't have problem, like the stress over the mental game is because I take the mental game out of the equation. Like I'm going to do this with a disc. In a tournament, 33,000 times in my life. And at the end of it, I will make whatever percentage my skill level dictates. But that every individual shot, I have no control of that individual shot. I can just do this. So that's kind of like, you know, that's uh, probably, a, I don't know, I, I, I never think I explained this very well because I'm kind of a little bit all over the place. I don't have a polished explanation for it, but I think that you get the idea. Yeah. It's yeah. about letting go. Right. And um, it starts with understanding that you can't make yourself make the putt anyways, even if you wanted to. Michael Jordan can't hit a higher percentage with two minutes to go in the game. Michael Jordan can't be a clutch player. 
what's you know what chance do me and you have? Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Um, as I as I scratch the bug bites on my <laughs> neck, that's uh, so. Yeah. Oh well, you know, personally, I was. I really want to take from this, and I think that I got a a little uh, whatever happens in your brain when something clicks a little bit. So hopefully, yeah, it'll help me just out. Just let go. Something. Yeah, it's like, the same uh, reason why, like, I step up, and, and again, I'm not uh, like everyone's different. So you got to like find your own place, like what is letting go to you. But when I practice, I don't line up, dig my back heel in, take three pumps, look at it, take a breath and putt. I don't do that when I practice. When I practice, I take the putt and I step up and putt. I do exactly what I do in practice at a tournament. Why would I do something different in a tournament? Like yeah. then I'm practicing. That makes no sense. You know, and I don't want to do all that root, the putting routine in, a, in practice because then I get only 25% as many practice putts in in my finite amount of time I have to practice. Yeah. And uh, so, it, it like, to me, it's just I, I just replicate my practice. Like, some people say I rush, and I, I don't rush. I replicate my practice. I do exactly what I do in practice, for better or for worse, because I, I know I can't be better than I am in practice. Sure. I don't think anybody can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, advice from the advice from you. I'll quit calling you a legend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Is, is, uh, My favorite people in the world are, are the ones who compliment me endlessly. I got. <laughs> I like those people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I. No, I look. I honestly, I'm flattered by by compliments. I mean, it. it, all, it I. I never. I never take it for granted. It means a lot to me. And uh, I think the moment it doesn't make you a little uncomfortable, then you're kind of a douchebag. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Right, it makes sense. Yeah. Like I don't use I don't even use the word fans. I say followers. I say uh, my people. I I don't even like that word fans. It's yeah. just I mean, and I know I'm fans of all the like half the kids on or all the kids on tour. I'm a fan of theirs, and I don't think that's wrong at all. Yet I don't like people to call themselves fans of mine because I'm like we're just frisbee golfers. It's just I don't know. It's it's awkward. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I have the question of. Uh, I don't know if you've ever ran into this, but mm -hmm. when you're about to throw, um, and you've you played so so much and at such a high level that maybe this isn't something, maybe, but there was a long time back. Do you ever have any, like, where you had, like, a mechanical thought as you're about to throw, like, I, I better do this, or, or mechanical, or some other thought, mm -hmm. that once you got into your, because personally, I'll sometimes lately get into my X step, and I'll kind of uh, think, uh, I better not hit that tree or whatnot. And I always hit that tree. If I ever think, don't do that, I always do. I know there's the, the law sure. of attraction sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but, well, no. So you definitely don't want to think about mechanics when you're competing. Um, if you're thinking about your mechanics, you are less likely to perform well. And I'm going to just give you another example. I mean, this is the, the, the data on this. A tennis player serving a ball. Okay, they've tossed that ball up and served, you know, 40, 30 or 40 million times in their career. I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous number. Maybe it's 12 million. But it's a lot. They practice serving. There is no chance that they tossed the ball up and, and it was not high enough. Right? If they tossed it up and they, and they decide to catch it and don't serve, something's in their head. Whether, and, and it's a chance of something mechanical. After doing that, they're, they're less likely to make the next shot. So there's evidence that thinking during the sport will mess you up. You know, all the thinking, like, with our brains when it comes to sports, up until the moment we step up onto the tee pad, and you can apply this to any sport, but in our sport, the moment you step up to the tee pad, up until the moment you step up to putt, your brain's your best friend. It's what tells you to practice. It's what makes you learn good technique. You know, it, your brain is your best friend. The minute you step up to throw, the, your brain can't help you anymore. It, 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 is, it is either your worst enemy or it's neutral. But your brain can't help you. Again, it can't make you perform. It can only hurt you. Your brain gets in the way. So it's not that your brain's not your friend. It's just not your friend when you're actually doing the thing. Yeah, that's where you just got to shut it off. Now, that's easier said than done. Sure. That's not something that's easy. But for sure, I would say you have to let go. Um, when you're in practice, do you think about those mechanical things, or do you just step up and throw? Um, actually, kind of both. 
because sometimes I think mm. about a mechanical thing because I'm trying to change. Okay. Well, I mean, and you're supposed to but, in those situations because you're practicing. But then, but then once I get into a flow, I'm just, I'm just doing it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you don't, I mean, thinking about it in practice is almost like on purpose because you're working on mechanics and technique, but you have to, you have to let go of it in tournaments and just trust. You have no, again, it's that control thing. You have no control. Yeah. I have no control if I'm going to hit that tree or not. <laughs> You know, yeah. I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just, I well, can just do this. That's all I can do is this. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I've got a couple of things that, because I'm the type of person, I'm always like, okay, what am I going to do? And as I'm sure you are with actions, you know, what's the action plan? And so I'm going to experiment. I'm always experimenting. Mm -hmm. I'm an amateur disc golfer. <laughs> experimenting on everything. Um, so the main things I think that I have latched onto are letting go of control completely when I'm going into the tournament mm -hmm. and then leaving my brain at home and yeah. letting my body do the work. Cause whenever I let my body mm -hmm. do those motions, the muscle memory, then it goes fine. Yeah. I mean, so. and that's, and that's all you can do. Again, that's, that's making sure you get that 70% that your skill level predicts that you are able to do. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's nothing stopping it from happening. You know, there's things that can stop it. Yeah. For sure. Um, are there any things, uh, and this might, those two things are the main points I, I think, yeah. but um, is there any way to train kind of the, this might be actually the opposite of what your philosophy on it is, but train your mental muscle at all to actually do these couple things or not really? That's kind of opposite. Of I mean, you can, no, I mean, to me, to me, it's just about letting go. Now, there are schools of thought that will talk about visualization, and the, the, here's the thing that makes it so tricky. I mean, correlation versus causation. When someone says, well, you need to visualize, and, well, this is what so-and-so athlete does. He visualizes every hole on the golf course, you know, before he plays the next day. He visualizes the perfect shot. Like maybe, so, I don't know if Tiger Woods ever said this, but let's say Tiger Woods said, you know, the night before every tournament, I go through each hole and I visualize what the perfect shot would look like. All right. What we would take from this on the surface, if you're a ball golfer, would be, oh, well, this is the visualization, that, that, which is why Tiger Woods hits these good shots. This is going to help me. That's ignoring the fact that there's data that shows that there's no such thing as a mental game that elevates your game. But... You, you, like, sure, Tiger Woods might do that, but in a parallel universe, when Tiger Woods just goes out and doesn't do that, is he worse? Like, I would argue that even though that's what Tiger Woods does, I would argue, we're talking Tiger Woods 20 years ago, but I would, <laughs> I would argue that if Tiger Woods didn't do that, if he, played, if he played Mario Kart the night before a tournament, I would argue that he would shoot the same score the next day because he's Tiger freaking Woods. He was the best golfer in the world. I don't think the visualization helped him any more than like, hey, I always wore a red shirt. Oh, wow, red shirt. That's the key. Yeah. Again, I can't, you know, prove this, and I'm, I'm saying something that contradicts a lot of people, a lot of people who are far more knowledgeable and smarter than me, and I think they're wrong. Sure. I, I think, to me, the data backs this up. You know, show me that Michael Jordan was better in the playoffs. And then I'm like, now I'm interested. And even that wouldn't mean he had, he elevated his mental game. Maybe that meant that he didn't try as hard in this regular season. That's still not, that's still correlation, but it's a more interesting correlation. But when you can't even produce data that shows that you elevate your game, I'm, you know, I, I'm like, I don't buy it. For me. Mm -hmm. Again, one more time. I acknowledge the people that disagree with me are smarter than me. So take take what I say with a grain of salt. I dropped that at school when I was fifteen. I'm a no. fris I'm a frisbee golfer, but <laughs> it's it's what I believe. Well, and there's a reason why um, I were asking you because you're uh, you're a legend in disc golf. So I'll say it again. I don't mind. It's that. okay. Now I'm past it. I'm just going okay. to say it. Um, so and uh, so. We really appreciate this. This is incredible um, to me. It's, uh, it's great. an opportunity that's um, there's no no replacement for an opportunity to pick 
the mind of of someone like yourself as a disc golfer. So uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Thank you very much. Hey, can we go and add something to this then? As long as everybody's tuned in for mental game, the illusion of control and the probabilities, that's also why you'll never get mad at them, of course. Because you will, if you played disc golf in 2026, you will have your lowest rated tournament round one time that year. I will guarantee you, if, if, if you play tournaments in 2026, you will have your worst round. That's 100% probability. Right. So when that happens, why would you get upset? It's a guarantee that you're going to have your worst round of the year. You had no control over that. You have no control over that outcome. I will guarantee you that you will have, well, I guess I need a crystal ball, but let's, let's use our imagination and say you're going to play 16 tournaments in 2026. I think you're going to have uh, 41 cut-throughs that season. 41 times that this is going to cut through the chains and go out the back. Seems like bad luck, right? Well, no, 41 is about how the percentage that baskets will let your disc cut through. Probabilities dictate that it might be 36, it might be 45, but it's about 41. Well, then every time one of those cuts through, what's there to be upset over? It's a given those are going to happen. Probabilities said that it would be impossible for that not to Not impossible mathematically, but astronomically unlikely. Um, now, most people can buy into that, but what about if they happen twice in the same nine holes? Oh my God, now that seems like the, the, the gods are kicking you, kicking you while you're down, except plot 41 cut-throughs in a, in a tournament season that long. Like, they're not going to be one every two rounds in intervals. You're going to have two in nine holes. So you'll probably have three in one round that, that season if you have 41 for the year. Or three in one uh, one round if you have forty one for the season. That's just that's the way that's the way uh, probabilities result in clusters of data. So why would you be upset? It's like that's probably going to happen. You'll probably also what you won't remember is that the all you also that same season won't remember the fact that you just went five and a half rounds without a spit out. You ain't gonna remember that. Sure. But probabilities dictate you have clusters of good results. Yeah. Again, if you let go of the control and understand that this probability is, why would you ever get upset? You know, I, I can't, look, I have a hard time with, oh, it's just a game or, you know, it's just a, you know, it's just a, you know, we're just having, we're out here to have fun. Yeah, maybe. Since when is the game of golf, any version of golf, not about wanting to perform well and kind of being pissed off when you don't? That's kind of what golf is. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't like that approach of like that. I mean, I agree with it. You should keep it in perspective. But to me, that doesn't turn off my brain. Probabilities are why I never get upset. I never get upset because I'm going to have another 750 spit outs before I die. Why would anyone upset me? I'll have that many. Mm -hmm. Probabilities. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to add to that because that's, yeah. that's the other side of... Uh, yeah, of pro of how probabilities are your friend. Awesome. Well, thank you, sir. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. I wanted to throw your disc over the water. <laughs> I wanted to scare you. I want to throw this beautiful wrench and stoke the discs. <laughs>